Support for Backpage has been provided by Coho Pono Multimedia Publishing on the web at cohopono.com. Hello and welcome again to Backpage. I'm Jody C. And today we're visiting with Lois Levine about this remarkable book. It's called The Secrets of Mary Bowser. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. This was a fascinating story. Yes. I mean, really fascinating. Yes. Um, tell me the genesis. How did this come about? You started off doing research on one thing and went, hmm. Mm. But I was never supposed to be a novelist. Yeah. I was supposed to be a college professor and you know write and give lectures about other people's novels. Well, see, there you go. But I was working on my PhD and came across in a big book, in a 300-page history book, there were maybe three paragraphs about Mary Bowser. So she was a real person. Mm -hmm. She was born in slavery in Richmond, Virginia, freed and sent north to be educated by Bette Van Loo, the daughter of the family that had owned her. But then Mary made the unusual choice of going back to the South, and during the Civil War, she became a spy in the Confederate White House by pretending to be a slave. Yeah. So she was spying for the Union, as was Bette Van Loo, the woman who had owned her and freed her. Fascinating part about this was that during that time, you could be um, hanged mm -hmm. for teaching a slave how to read. Wasn't that true? I think you could. It, it, it varied from place to place. But she could have been killed for knowing how to read. It was, certainly it was against the law yeah. in the state of Virginia. It was against the law for an educated black person to return to the state. Yeah. So if you went out of the state to be educated, even just by coming back, she was breaking the law. Yeah. Certainly spying was a capital crime. And, <laughs> yeah. and there were many spies yeah. who were hanged in R Richmond yeah. during the war. But the thing about Mary was that she was brilliant. And she had a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. So when she got back to Jefferson Davis's house, so she could just be pretending to right. work with her feather duster and look at something on the desk and remember it. Yes. And then could get that information to the people who needed it. Yes. I was like, whoa. I know. It's, it is an incredible story. And I think also just that what, one of the things that drew me to her was the idea of taking the stereotypes about women, mm -hmm. about blacks, certainly about slaves, and challenging them by playing to them. Yeah. So, you know, I see she wasn't above suspicion, she was below suspicion. They just didn't think it was possible. And for her part, Bette Van Loo also played mm -hmm. to the certain stereotypes around being female, and Bette sometimes put on the, people used to call her crazy Bette, so she was willing to put on a persona. So they both knew how to play at what people expected of them mm -hmm. to cover the fact that they were doing something entirely unexpected. Wow, yeah. what a story. Yeah. How long did it take you to write this? Well, there's a lot of research that goes into this book. Yeah. Um, and it starts long before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I should admit that there, are, I think there are two kinds of people in the United States, those who love the Civil War and always want to learn more and they do the battlefield tours and they're always reading everything and the people who you say Civil War and their eyes kind of start to glaze over with boredom because mm -hmm. they remember it was dreadful to study in school. Mm -hmm. I was really in the latter category when I started this book mm -hmm. uh, and I say this is the Civil War book for you know the obsessed will learn something about it but yeah. those who don't think that they're interested in it, it will find a story that I think draws people in. So I had a lot of research to do um, not just about the Civil War part, but I start the novel much earlier in Mary's childhood, mm -hmm. in part because I wanted people, readers to think about what would it mean to be given your freedom but have to give up your family, your community, mm -hmm. the entire world you've ever known and go someplace entirely different? Yeah. What would it be like to arrive in this place where you're free but not equal? because there's no slavery in Philadelphia, but there is also, it's legal to discriminate in housing and schools and uh, employment. So what, is, what would that experience be like? And then what would it mean to give all that up and walk back into slavery? Mm -hmm. a, a book like this, I always joke, the spoiler alert is, the North wins the war. 
<laughs> slavery ends. Yeah. We know that yeah. as readers, yeah. but the characters don't. So for Mary, one of the things that interested me wasn't just like so the, the specifics of the spying, but what would it mean to make the choice to give up your freedom not knowing how the war is going to end yeah. and really not even knowing until well into the war that there would be an emancipation proclamation that that might affect slavery for the long term. Right. Well, you know, the the other fascinating part was that when Bette Van Loo freed Mary, she freed her mother as well, but the mother didn't want to leave Mary's dad. And the guy who owned Mary's dad wasn't about to give him up because he was a good blacksmith. Yes. So, so they made the choice, you know? And I should say that although Mary Bowser was a real person, mm -hmm. very little is known about her. So the the family that she has in this book, we know when she was married and where she was married and to whom she was married because there's documents from the church. But her early family, her the family that she was born into, we don't really know anything about. So mm -hmm. I got, if I were writing a biography, it would have been very frustrating to work with Mary Bowser, but yeah. it was thrilling as a novelist to kind of have a few basic facts and then I, well, I love a <laughs> riddle too. So I used the historical yeah. research as though it was a riddle. I knew that, um, or I learned as I was researching this, that Virginia had a law at that time. Then there were lots of free blacks in the state of Virginia. In Richmond in particular, one out of every five black people in Richmond before the Civil War, right before the Civil War was free. Mm -hmm. So you had this incredible population, mostly enslaved, but one out of every five free. And unlike slaves on a plantation who are very isolated, mm -hmm. no plantations in this book. It's yeah. urban slavery. Yeah, urban very slavery. Very different story. So what, how did they document that? Did they have to carry papers with them that proved they yes, were free? you would have to carry free oh, papers. Okay. And in fact, um, although it doesn't come up in the book, I do know that when Mary went back to Richmond after she had been living in the North, she was taken in for not carrying her papers. Mm -hmm. And Bette's mother had to claim her and pay a fine for letting her slave go about uh, without proper papers. The complication is that Virginia has this law that was passed in the middle of the 19th century saying anybody who is newly freed has to leave the state. If you stay in the state for more than a year, you'll be sold back into slavery. So I loved the idea of taking that into this story and creating mm -hmm. this dilemma for Mary and her family. Uh, and knowing that that was often the case, that even if you, it was very rare to have an owner who would choose to manumit their slaves, to free mm -hmm. their slaves. But even if you did, you would be tied to other people in the community. And what would it mean to have to make that choice? Yeah. So I give both Mary and her mother that choice and they choose differently, although her mother kind of has to go undercover in her own way mm -hmm. to be able to stay in the state and, and stay with her partner. Mm -hmm. We would say husband, although of right. course they yeah. were not legally married, but they saw themselves as married. Right. And she only got to see him, what, on the weekends or something? Yes. One day a week? Right, yes. You know. Although that is one of those things that I didn't know when I started doing the research, but because of the setting of Richmond, that, that urban industrial slavery, it some enslaved people who lived in Richmond actually had more freedom to move around. Mm -hmm. So that on Sundays you could be with somebody if you weren't if your owner didn't force you to work, you might be able to be with other family members who you wouldn't normally see. Again, if you were on a plantation, you were monitored far more closely and far more constantly and you were more isolated. Mm -hmm. So the ability to get across town as opposed to miles and miles to another plantation really changes the dynamic for the slave family, but they're just as vulnerable yeah. as, as any other enslaved family. Um, the other part about Mary Bowser was that she was involved with the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, in, in this story, her, um, her friend's father is mm -hmm. an undertaker, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the slaves, the black people, would arrive in coffins, mm -hmm. you know, and then they would, to Philadelphia, I guess, and then they would uncrate them and then they would be free. Which is, I mean, the whole thing's really risky. First of all, somebody could die right. in a coffin, you know. Well, and that is actually, although that character is a character that I invented for this story, mm -hmm. is based on a real person yeah. who did move cargo on the Underground Railroad. Yeah. That's what they called it, cargo, cargo. Or, or baggage. And 
and did it by as an undertaker by using coffins. Mm -hmm. So again, this interesting analogy to being a slave who's a spy, being an undertaker who's moving bodies, mm -hmm. it's the, how do you figure out how to hide in plain sight? That in some ways the, um, the best disguise is the one that is doing just what people think you're supposed to be doing, but doing it in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I went to see um, Lincoln mm -hmm. last weekend. Wow, yeah, what a what a show! But the fascinating part to me was that how caught up I was in the hmm, is it are they going to get the votes they need for the Thirteenth right. Amendment? You know, I was right. like, I mean, and it's not like I didn't know how it turned out, right. but and I felt the same way with with your book. I was like, oh gosh, oh what's, what's going to happen? You know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the spoiler alert didn't harm you. No, that no you not knew at the all. North not at all. Well, you know, and and I'm from the South. You know, I mean. Mm -hmm. And the people that I grew up with still refer to the Civil War as the War of Northern Ag Aggression. So, it is an interesting thing. Now, I should say, um, uh, Books a Million Bookstore, which mm -hmm. people in the Northwest don't necessarily know because it really is a Southeast chain, although it right. is the second largest book chain in the country after Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. They pick this for their book club pick, which is a huge thing. You know, they feature it in all of their stores, and mm -hmm. it really engages a lot of readers. And they're headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama, yeah. a city that is was known during the Civil Rights Movement as perhaps the most violent and racist city in America. Yeah. So I think part of it does indicate we're in a new era. Some people are moving perhaps not quite as quickly into that era as yeah. we would like. But this we are right now in the sesquicentennial. You can say that word in Oregon because Oregonians no, we've just had our we state, did it. Yeah. state sesquicentennial. Yeah. But now it is the sesquicentennial, our 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see how that is being commemorated around the country. Yeah. The 100th anniversary of the Civil War, of course, came during the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. And not everybody realizes that those southern states that are so adamant about flying the Confederate flag may not have been flying the Confederate flag in the first part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. but it became a way to kind of say you were celebrating the anniversary of the Civil War, but really be trying to fight a new war as the Civil Rights Movement was yeah. erupting. So yeah. I do feel like there's a big change between that era and this era at the 100th anniversary versus the 150th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Civil War. Well, you know, um my great-grandfather was the seventh son of the seventh son, which was supposed to mean something, but I can't remember what it is. And this was a poor South Carolina farm family. When the Civil War came along, um, all of his brothers, he went off to fight in the war, and all of them were killed, yeah. except my great-grandfather. He, he was only 14, his mother wouldn't let him go. And one of the boys deserted and hid in a shack in the woods. Mm -hmm. He could never go home again because his father was going to kill him for cowardice. And bottom line is that, you know, these guys, this family didn't have any slaves. Yeah. Their life would have been exactly the same, but it was something about, you can't tell me what to do. That kind of, and not wanting to be the low man on the totem pole. Well, I think it's, it's hard. For one thing, yes, you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Most Southerners, most white Southerners did not own slaves. Mm -hmm. It's not even clear that they, they may have, been more harmed than benefited by the system of slavery because if some people can benefit from slave labor, it's hard for you to compete as a worker. Right. So if you're not rich enough to own slaves, right. which is pretty much an accident of birth for most people, yeah. you're not helped by that system. Yeah. But I think it's also hard for us to think about state identification, that people would, didn't necessarily think of themselves as Americans as much as they thought of themselves as Virginians mm -hmm. or New Yorkers or yeah. Ohioans, that people had a very strong sense of state identity. And I think for Bette Van Loo, for example, this is a difficult thing that she, Bette, uh, and there's much more documented about her life than Mary Bowser's life. She never considered herself a spy. She thought she was a patriot because she felt she was a citizen of the United States and that there was no right on the part of Virginia to secede. And so she wasn't doing anything seditious to the government. The right. go that what claimed to be the government was itself <laughs> yeah. seditious. And, you know, and Good it, for her. Well, and you know? when, even when Virginia seceded, which it almost didn't do, mm -hmm. um, they, it wasn't clear that Virginia was going to join the Confederacy. So it might have been the independent state 
or independent nation of Virginia mm -hmm. in between the United States and the Confederate States. And I suspect, we'll never know, but it would have been a much shorter war because Virginia brought two things to the party. Uh, they, it brought the only ironworks that could make cannon and similar munitions in all of the South. Mm -hmm. So without that, not doing so well to try and fight a war. Right. And Robert E. Lee, who, yeah. you know, whoever you were rooting for in yeah. that war, he was a, a, an amazing man as and, a military and leader. And the reason he went with the Confederacy was because he said he, and it was offered to him, the Union right. leadership was offered to him originally, but he said he could not raise a sword against Virginia, yes. which was his home state. Yes. And, I, and that, even saying that now still makes me want to cry. Although, you know, you know there's that question that they ask, they ask, I don't know if they still do, but they used to ask on the college essays, if you could have dinner with any person living or dead, who mm -hmm. would it be and why? And of course, in some ways, I want to say Mary Bowser. Mm -hmm. But part of me would, would love to be able to say to Robert E. Lee, who really understood profoundly the amount of destruction that the war cost yeah. ultimately, if, if you knew, knowing what you know about the outcome of the war, would you have chosen the personal dishonor of not serving mm -hmm. with Virginia and not serving with the Confederacy and feeling like you were you know, shamed for not doing what was considered right for a Virginian, but perhaps the war would have ended earlier and perhaps fewer people would have died. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an incredibly destructive force. Yeah. Wow. If you're just tuning in, um, too bad for you because we're we almost done, but this has been a great interview with Lois Levine who's written a really fascinating book called The Secrets of Mary Bowser. When, where can people get this book? Hopefully anywhere. I anywhere. mean, it, all, all the usual places. And um, it came out, we came out in trade paperback rather than hardback. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful book. So, you know, as somebody said, oh, you could give this as a present. And I think people are. Mm -hmm. But um, we wanted people to be able to buy it. You know, when you come out in hardback, it costs twice as mon yeah. much money for the same book. Right. So the paperback is available at all the usual bookstores that you would find it. Um, and there's also the digital version, which you can find at all those usual places and an audio version, which is, I have to say, quite thrilling for an author mm -hmm. to hear somebody else read your words. I mean, I, it's narrated from the point of view of Mary Bowser, mm -hmm. and I hear her voice in my head, or yeah. I did as I was writing, but then to hear somebody who's an incredibly talented voice actress mm -hmm. bring to life not just Mary, but all of the characters in the book is sort of what gives you the goosebumps. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. So do you have a favorite um, independent bookstore. We like to plug the independent bookstores on this show. Well, of course, living in Portland, we're, we're pretty blessed. Mm -hmm. um, Powell's has been really great with this book. Broadway Books has been really mm -hmm. great with this book. Love Annie, Broadway Books. Annie Blooms is also a wonderful yeah. bookstore. And they have all, you know, I think part of it is we are, we are a booky place to live. Have you checked out Wallace Books over in Selwood? No. Good bookstore. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great to Funky know. Funky little yellow house with blue trim. Julie oh. Wallace owns it. I will look for it because, yeah. you know, since Looking Glass unfortunately went out of mm -hmm. business, it has felt like a little bit of a dearth in yeah. Southeast. But those, uh, my two favorites are Broadway Books and, and Wallace Books. So okay. I always like to give them a plug. Yes. You know, we yeah. want, we actually want all bookstores to do well, but especially the independent bookstores because their, their profit margins are so teeny and we want them to stay in business because we love books. Well, it's not just, it is that we love books. It is, we see in the publishing industry as there are fewer and fewer publishers and fewer and fewer places to buy books. Mm -hmm. It's harder for authors to get ideas out there. I mean, people get so excited. This took a long time to write this book. Mm -hmm. And if people aren't finding it, then I don't have the time to write another book. And and I think also, my, my brother owns a bike shop in Olympia. So I, I know just from his experience, independent stores, Mm -hmm. put dollars back into the community in a different way than when you buy from a big chain that doesn't doesn't That's put true. its you know its profits yeah. don't come back into the community yeah. so an extra reason we love our local bookstores we love our local everything you know? <laughs> we do anyway tell me what you're working on now i know you're promoting the books which is and i'm, and I'm glad you're here because yes. this is a nice shot in the yes. arm when you're trying to promote a book being yes. on our show beats a poke in the eye with a sharp stick i think many things be to poke in the eye with a sharp <laughs> stick, but I think being on the show is probably has more merit than just that. Yeah. Well, so what are you doing? What are, what are you working on? Well, have you I, got a new idea? I I have to say that um, I'm a little bit cagey. Uh, there is something that I'm working on, and it really surprises me. I thought I would keep doing footnotes from American history, and mm -hmm. I kind of had an idea in my head, and it was starting to take shape, and then somebody else intruded in my head by just a, a title popped into my head. Uh -huh. At first, I thought, oh. I'm, Maybe that's a movie that's just out that I haven't 
you know, that mm -hmm. I heard of. <laughs> and I checked, and no, nobody's, nobody's written this book before. Nobody's made the movie or yeah. the song or anything. Um, but it's not set in the United States, so it, it is even more work in the historical research. I'm immersing myself in a new time and a new place. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, a very different story. And in other ways, I'm just beginning to realize, I mean, this is my first novel. Mm -hmm. I say I'm an accidental novelist. If I hadn't discovered Mary Bowser, I would not have ever thought of myself as a novelist. Yeah. But I wanted to tell the story, as I said, not enough for a biography. Mm -hmm. So now it's thinking about, well, you can, I don't think that you can plan to have themes in your work. But you start a new project, and then you start to see what the themes are that carry mm -hmm. from one to another. So in some ways, a very different character in a very different place and time. And in other ways, we'll see how much there's some thematic. Well, have you ever noticed that once you have an idea, and even the title, if you don't get it down on, mm -hmm. on your computer or on paper or something, it's going to ride around on the top of your back like a, like a big mean chimp gnawing at your, the back of your neck until you get it done. Well, and that you is know? what Mary Bowser did for me. It was a long time between those three paragraphs, and I thought, oh, that is a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. I'd love to write a book about that. <laughs> and I just, it took a long time before I sat down. And, you know, people will often say when they hear you have a book out, oh, I'm, I want to write a book one day. And I think, you don't write a book one day. You write a book <laughs> every Many day. Days. And for, every day. I mean, yeah. you know, the same way that people who are athletes know that it's not just on game day that mm -hmm. you are you know you are training all the time you are right. building for that all the time yeah I don't think people um, really understand how long it takes and and when you sit down or it, you know the first day you sit down you know crack your knuckles yes. you're ready to go but the suddenly the canvas is so huge it could go any direction at all yeah, uh, uh, Ernest J. Gaines, who's a very well-known novelist, said, when you, get, when you start a new novel, you get on a train, and you know that you're headed from you know, Portland to Philadelphia, and you pack your luggage, but you don't know, as you're riding on that train, who else is going to get on and off, and what they're going to be serving for lunch, and all these other things. And then sometimes you get off the train, and it turns out you're not in Philadelphia, you're in New York. <laughs> And I think it's, it is a very <laughs> yeah. terrifying and yet reassuring metaphor yeah. for a writer to say, I, you know, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure yet. I think I know what this is about, but yeah. I don't. And I think those are the best books, the ones that, where the characters are so real and vivid mm -hmm. that they do things to the narrative that you don't necessarily even expect mm -hmm. or see coming. I mean, there, there's, I, I don't want to give away plot, despite aside from North Wind's War. Um, but there's something dramatic that happens to Mary uh, almost right at the end of the book. It is sort of like the, the, the moment at which all of the violence for the war really comes home mm -hmm. and, and she realizes how deeply imbricated in it she is. But there's a point much earlier in the novel that kind of parallels that moment. And it's not as though I put that in thinking, oh yes, later I'll get to this other moment. And I'll, mm -hmm. I mean, it does feel like it happened I want to say by chance or serendipity, yeah. but maybe some of it is also that you work as many artists do across different media without always knowing what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. And, and then it, it'll change on you too. Yes. You yes. know, like it's got a life of its own as much as you try to take it in this direction. Yes. If it wants to go there, it's going to go there. Well, you think of the metaphor of the painter who is to, you know, paint up close like this and then you step back from the canvas and you mm -hmm. see this piece and think, ah, yes, or, ooh, that really worked there, but it doesn't work in terms of the mm -hmm. whole piece. I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of writing is rewriting. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I remember being at a, a Willamette Writers meeting one time, and this one guy, I can't remember his name, but they were, he just got his first novel published. And everybody was oh, you know, and they said he did everything right. He did this and this and this and this, and he rewrote it five times. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I remember thinking in my head. Jeepers, I wouldn't rewrite something five times, but you it, do. People ask me how many drafts, and I mm -hmm. say, if mm -hmm. you can still count, you're not done yet. <laughs> well, you know, when I finished the first draft, I gave it to a good friend of mine who is a novelist to read, and she said, it sounds like Mary Bowser's thesis, and I knew I wasn't done. Yeah. I, you know, but I think it also pays off. Um, when you are writing, it can feel like, I just want people to read it. I just want people to read it. But I think that it is true, though 
a painful truth that the more time you take to rework it, the more people who give you input, the better the book ends up being. And yeah. you know, this it's important to me that, that this book touches people. One of the first people to read it was my lawyer. I gave her the advanced reader's copy, mm -hmm. told her she wasn't allowed to tell anybody she had one. Mm -hmm. And she said to me afterwards, you know, I was reading it at the gym and I cried on the treadmill twice. <laughs> I made a lawyer cry. Yeah, it's doing its work. <laughs> it is doing its work. You know, the, um, Simon and Schuster came very close to buying my first book, and uh, but they wanted this redone and this redone and so forth. And and I was in Dallas with uh, I was in the car with my friend Charlotte, and we've been buddies. We used to work together in rock and roll radio, so we've known each other forever. And I was pouty, you know. And and she goes, so you, every time you've rewritten it, you liked it better, right? And I said. Yeah. She goes, well, there's your answer. Mm -hmm. And then she reached across the car and she slaps my leg. And she goes, not only that, it's Simon & Schuster, you <laughs> butt. She said three months ago they didn't even know your name. You know, so. Well, but I think that there certainly, at one point somebody was interested in the book. And, but they said, you know, we, we want you to maybe have alternating chapters where so one is from Beth's point of view and one's from Mary's point of view. And I thought, no, I, I really, Mary Bowser deserves to get her own mm -hmm. story. That yeah. was really important to me. Um, you know, there were people who said, well, just start with the Civil War stuff. That's what's really interesting. Well, actually, to me, understanding Mary and her family and her attachment to her family, mm -hmm. she's not just a spy. She's a person. Right. And, and, you know, that I enjoy James Bond films as much as the next person. <laughs> but I yeah. wanted her to have that depth. And actually, the new James Bond film tells us a lot more about his family than we ever knew. Ah. So maybe he's taken a page from Mary Bowser. Maybe so. So now you're you're from you're not from Portland. You're no. from where'd you come from? East Coast somewhere. Yeah, the suburbs of New York. Okay. And so how long did you really that's a long way away. It is. I've lived on the West Coast for pretty much since I graduated from college. Okay. So. And and you came out here to teach? At to, yeah. I came to Portland to take a three year teaching position at Reed College twelve years ago. <laughs> so you can tell I like I like yeah. this place. Well, we're glad you're here. Glad you wrote this book. We're going to have to saddle up and ride out of here. Okay. I'm Jody C. This program is Backpage. Join us again next time as we take another peek at the Backpage. And remember, we're all in this together. More the same than different. Do your best. And get this book. Thank you. Support for Backpage has been provided by Coho Pono Multimedia Publishing on the web at cohopono.com.